Chris Bankett today. Chris is our is our speaker, a native of, from Ohio. He has lived in Atlanta for 12 years. He's always interested in anything historical. And 40 years ago, Chris set out to acquire one biography of each president. That modest goal, of course, now encompasses hundreds of volumes on the presidents, and includes many items of interest, such as memorabilia, campaign pins, old newspapers from presidential events and the like, as well as many visits to presidential libraries and historical sites. He has volunteered as a docent at the William Howard Taft National Historic Site in Cincinnati. He's developed a one day uh, at a time with the president's calendar and has presented engaging talks at his children's and grandchildren's grade schools, as well as many local service clubs and church groups over the years. Please, if you would, let's welcome Chris Pinker. stops here, man from Missouri, show me state, and, and we're going to talk about Harry in a few minutes too. Um, well, Donald Trump's our president, he's number 45, and he's a polarizing figure, we would all agree with that, but the one thing we also would agree with is we want him to succeed. He's the president for all of us, we want him to succeed. And one of the things about Donald Trump is he, he came into office as an outsider. But he wasn't the first one to be get into that office as an outsider. Certainly right here in Georgia, Jimmy Carter had never owned a position, held a position in the government, the federal government. He was truly, and ran as an outsider, if you might recall. His campaign in 1976 was all about, I'm not from here. I'm not from Washington, and I'm gonna help fix it. But our presidents have some unusual backgrounds. Obviously, Mr. Trump was a reality TV star. We all remember, I think, Ronald Reagan was a movie man. Uh, but we've had some unusual ones, too. We have, well, Mr. Carter was a farmer. One of our presidents was a sheriff and a hangman. That was his job. 
That was for the plea, but he was the only president elected to two non-consecutive terms. Um, and finally, we've had two that were college presidents. Woodrow Wilson, that's the easy one. Thank you, Eisenhower. Very good. He was president briefly of Columbia University. After World War II, five-star general, hero of the world, Columbia needed a strong figure to raise the money. So they hired Ike to be the president of Columbia, bringing some money. So that, that worked pretty well. But all, uh, presidential backgrounds, the most common occupation of presidents, at least heroic occupations, is that they were military figures, starting, of course, with George Washington. And one of the things I brought to show you a little tiny thin biography, The Life of Washington. The fun part is this was published in 1827. So this is really old, really in, in great condition. Found this in a little bookstore in Massachusetts where my son lives. Um, but of course, Washington, Andrew Jackson, Zachary Taylor, won the Mexican War, very hero of the Mexican War. Uh, General Civil War, General Grant, Rutherford Hayes, James Garfield. The Spanish War, Theodore Roosevelt, Eisenhower, of course, World War II, Richard Nixon was in World War II, JFK was in World War II, all with military history. And some say it's a great preparation to be commander in chief, which is one of those major pillars of, of responsibility that the president has. And even Mr. Trump went to military school. So another question for you. Who would say would you say is your favorite president? Sir, let me ask you that question. Who's your favorite president? Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan. Tell me why. He unified the country. Yeah, he was um, elected on a, of course, he defeated Mr. Carter and came in on a wave of uh, let's clean up the mess and get past Watergate and get a breath of fresh air and all of it. So, I can endorse that sentiment, you're right. How about you, who is your favorite president, would you say? Mm. Harry Truman? Okay. Well, he told the truth. He told the truth. They used to say famously, give him hell, Harry, because that's what he would do. He would tell the truth, he would tell it like it is. And he didn't care where the chips kind of fell, so to speak. He one time, um, his daughter, Margaret, was an accomplished pianist and opera singer. And she was pretty good, but not great. So she gave a performance in Washington, and the local uh, theater critic wrote a fairly scathing, not very flattering article about Margaret's performance. Harry Truman, the next morning after he read it, dashed off this incredibly intense letter that says, if, you, if I ever see you in person, you're going to need a beefsteak to cover up the black eye you're going to get from me. <laughs> So Harry, yeah, he'd like to tell what he was. How about you, sir? How about your favorite president? Uh, most of the time, I'd be Lincoln. OK. Certainly, he was a uh, terrible time in the country. He had a lot of vision, foresight, courage mm -hmm. to uh, help us to uh, retain the image. Yeah. A lot of people would say that of all the 45, Abe was maybe the greatest. And yet, he had so much failure in his life up to then. He failed in the military. He failed in, in his runs for Congress. He had failed in business. I mean, he, he truly had, had a lot of strife in his life um, until he got to that moment. And that's what American history is all about. Are we so fortunate to get to the right moment in our history and have the right person in that office to, to lead us where we need to go? Some would say FDR being there. Uh, in World War II and, and the Depression, it's a lot of the same idea. Mm -hmm. How about you, sir? Your favorite? Uh, I guess it would be Truman. Truman? For a different reason? Well, he, he, he saw us. Uh, well, I, That's okay. No problem. No problem. Uh, who's got another favorite president? Yes, sir.
he built up the military to the point where the Soviet Union couldn't really compete and it made it very difficult for them to compete. Yes, indeed. Good, good. One more, let's, one more. Favorite president. Yes, ma'am. Right, that's a, that's a good insight. He, he set the tone for much of what the presidency is. She really did. He, um, he set, famously set the two-year term, two term, term, term limit that was uh, the case until uh, FDR felt he needed to run for the third and fourth term. Um, but yes, he, and he's, we, we've just now said, well, there's Washington, he's on Mount Rushmore. We talked about Lincoln, Theodore Roosevelt, of course, Jefferson being the four in that right? um, Well, let's let's go through some other some other little interesting factors. John Quincy Adams, of course, he was son of the president, son of the president George Bush, son of George H. W. Bush. Um, but many many people don't realize John Quincy Adams. He was the man who wrote the Monroe Doctrine for President Monroe. He was the guts behind it, and was a famous diplomat. Got to be president, difficult. Uh, presidency, only the one term president, but he served in Congress 12 years following his presidency. This is very unusual, of course. Um, and he died of a stroke right at his desk in the, in the Capitol and died two days later, but he had the stroke like right there. Um, and then Andrew Johnson, another somewhat infamous president, because he became president after Lincoln was assassinated um, and was the first, the first president to be impeached. But he was elected a senator. Back then, electing a senator was from the legislature of the state. It wasn't a statewide popular election. The legislature all got together and said, here's who we want to be our senator. And, and so the senators from Tennessee, or legislators from Tennessee, got him to be their senator. He served for a very short time, only six months till he passed away. So those are the two that had gone on to elect their office after uh, they were president. And of course, Andrew Johnson, as I said, impeached. But the story there, and some of you would remember the famous Paul Harvey radio show, where he would say, and now you know the rest of the story. And that's what kind of these are like. Um, because President Johnson was impeached, it was a very political type impeachment. Uh, it came to, so the House, as you recall, the House votes articles of impeachment, and then the Senate has a trial. And there's a literal trial. He escaped being thrown out of office by one vote. That one vote was from a senator from, I believe it's Kansas. And famously, John F. Kennedy wrote a Pulitzer Prize winning book called Profiles and Courage. One of his six Profiles and Courage was about Senator Ross, who cast that deciding vote to keep Andrew Johnson in as president. So, uh, yeah, JFK won it in. In 1957, helped him become president himself. Now, William Henry Harrison, he's famous for, for what? The shortest presidency. Um, 31 days or 32 days. He gave the longest inaugural speech by far. It was over 8,000 words. It took over two hours to deliver in a sleep storm in Washington. And of course, he caught pneumonia and died 30 days later. Uh, some things very little people know about William Henry. We lived in Cincinnati, as Jim said, for 12 years. William Henry Harrison is buried in Cincinnati, just to the west of downtown. It's on a nice bluff overlooking the Ohio River. His whole family is all the Harrisons, including his wife, Anna Sims. Well, Anna Sims, her family was granted way back before he was, she ever met him. Her family was granted. 20,000 acres of land in southwest Ohio. 20,000 acres. And so the, uh, he, no, he didn't read and he lived there. But uh, the fun part for Sue, and this is my wife Sue sitting here joining us today. Sue and I lived in Sims Township. And Sims Township is named for Anna Sims. Uh, so these little factoids of history. 
A lot of people here say, who lives in Gwinnett County? Anybody live in Gwinnett County? Nobody. Well, few people seem to remember that Button Gwinnett signed the Declaration of Independence for, from Georgia. He was one of the few. That's where Gwinnett comes from. All these little things flooded my main um, So who would you say was the best real estate mogul among our presidents? Jefferson. Thank you. It's not Donald Trump. <laughs> It sounds Jefferson because of, you know? Louisiana Purchase. Yes, Louisiana Purchase. He bought over 800,000 square miles from Napoleon <coughs> for three cents an acre. Because Napoleon was fighting wars and he needed the money to, to buy an army. And so that's what happened. Uh, the Louisiana Purchase. So, you have a question, sir. Ah, uh, really? No, yeah, that's great. Right? I'm sure it's rare. So, we know a lot about Thomas Jefferson. One of his contemporaries was John Adams, second president, third president. Adams, <laughs> Jefferson. Both founding fathers, both deeply involved in our country's revolution and all that. The irony is they both died on the same day, July 4th, 1826. 50 years to the day that the Declaration of Independence was signed. And the story goes, John Adams, I'm, I'm, keep in mind, he's in Massachusetts, Jefferson is in Virginia. They're like three days ride apart, or four days, whatever it was. And, and Adams said, Thomas Jefferson lives, and that wasn't true. Mr. Jefferson had died just a few hours earlier, but he didn't know that then. But uh, there was one president, another president, who died on the 4th of July, James Monroe, who is another founding father, last of the true continental uh, founding fathers. He died July 4th, 1831. We had one president who was born on the 4th of July, Calvin Coolidge from Vermont. So who's heard the phrase, let's cut through that red tape? Cut through the red tape? Well, Martin Van Buren came up with that. We say it all the time, but there's a story behind it. Because then, when the law was being written and put together, they would, the printers had to go print the, the laws up so the legislators could read them, etc. So the printers would print a stack of them and tie them up in red tape, and they would deliver them. And so Mr. Van Buren said, we need to cut through that red tape and find out what's really in that piece of the legislation. So cut through the red tape is something that has stuck because Martin Van Buren put it out there. Maybe even more famously, there's a word that he influenced that is used probably several billion times a day. The word, the word is okay. Okay. Now why Martin Van Buren? Well, he was from a little town in upstate New York called Old Kinderhook. Old, okay, Old Kinderhook. And when he ran for president, after Andrew Johnson had Andrew Jackson had two terms. He was running with the phrase, he's okay, vote okay, and it stuck. Now the word okay, he didn't create that word, but he, in, in, in our terms, it went viral under him. So okay has stuck, and you can give that one to Martin Van Buren. You might not want to give him credit for this one. He wrote an entire like 800 page uh, autobiography and never once mentioned, mentioned his wife Anna's name. <laughs> Never once. Theodore Roosevelt um, is, he's my favorite. I'm wearing a little campaign button from 1904, Theodore Roosevelt. Um, he's my favorite, but one of the things he did was influence advertising. Because the phrase, good to the last drop, was for Maxwell House Coffee. Well, the Maxwell House is a real place outside of uh, Nashville. He had gone to Nashville to, to where the Hermitage, Andrew Jackson's estate was there, Mr. Roosevelt was there. And he came out of the restaurant and he was always good for a quote. And the reporters always waited around because they wanted a nice quote from Mr. Roosevelt. And they said, how'd you like your, your meal? That coffee was good to the last one. <laughs> and so they knew gold when they saw it and they used that for decades. <laughs> and they still do. I think good to the last one is still part of Maxwell House. Now, TR is my favorite for many reasons, and we could talk for hours about TR, but um, 
He's, he's influenced our life in so many ways. Some, some that you probably don't know. Right now, you're, some of you are probably carrying a, a Lincoln pen in your purse. Lincoln Penny came to be in 1907, I think. There had never been an American figure, person, on a coin. Never. There was always eagles and whatever. Buffaloes, Buffaloes yeah. Uh, uh, but never a, 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 a human, no, an American. And TR said, I want Mr. Lincoln to be on the pen. And so guess what? Here we are. And we got you know trains, I think the number is over a half trillion pennies, Lincoln pennies have been minted since then, but he, he made that happen. He won the Medal of Honor for his charge up San Juan Hill in 1898. But he didn't win it right away. Bill Clinton posthumously awarded him the Medal of Honor in 1998 on the 100th anniversary of San Juan. And coincidentally, Theodore Roosevelt's son, his first son, Ken, also won the Medal of Honor because he was part of the DB invasion and died like three days or so after DB, which by the way is tomorrow, the 75th anniversary is tomorrow. Um, but both Ted and he saw the Theodore won the Medal of Honor. They weren't the first, however, father and son to win the Medal of Honor. Douglas MacArthur and his father, Arthur MacArthur, also won the Medal of Honor. So Mark Roosevelt's went the first, but it's still pretty cool. Um, he was the first president to win the Nobel Peace Prize. He settled a long running war between Russia and Japan in 1905. Uh, he was an author of 30 books. He was a scientist. He was, a, of course, the Rough Rider. He was an adventurer. He went down and discovered a new river in Brazil called the River of Doubt. If you look at a map, it's not called the River of Doubt anymore. It's called Rio Roosevelt. Rio Roosevelt. Look at a map. It's right there. It's named after him. Um, he was an environmentalist. He set aside 230 million acres of land. Uh, he was a rancher. And, and I know Jimmy has given talks about Theodore Roosevelt. And <clears throat> we all know, of course, where the teddy bear kind of came from, right? That's a real story. When he was president, he loved it. He was a hunter. Loved. He'd been to Africa safaris. If you go to his home in Oyster Bay, New York, you see all these bison and elk and animals hanging on. Um, but they took him on a hunting trip when he was down south. I think it was in Arkansas, I believe. And he'd hunted all day and hadn't done it. So they really wanted him to you know, get something that day. So they had. Had a bear, got a bear. Whatever they did, they tied the bear to a tree and said, Mr. President, here you go. And of course, he refused to shoot the helpless, tied up critter. And, um, and so that story kind of got out, because he was famous for quotes. And get, that story got out there. Well, not long after, uh, he was approached by a toy manufacturer who said, we love that story. We'd like to create. A bear, a stuffed bear. And Mr. Roosevelt said, well, sure, go ahead. I don't care. Knock yourself out. But I don't see why that would be popular. <laughs> so seven trillion teddy bears later, we have it. So one more story about Teddy, and I'll move on. He, uh, when he was in the White House, of course, he was a believer in what he called the strenuous life, physical activity. And he was as mad as a child. When he was your age, he they didn't think he was going to make it. But he went west, he got himself fit, so he believed in the strenuous life. So when he was in the White House, the army, he felt, was getting fat and flat, not in good shape. And he said, every officer should be able to ride 100 miles in a day. And, and that, that should be something that we use as a fitness test. He says, to show you, I'm going to do it. They set up, this is in January or February, cold in Washington. He set the date, going to do it. Got four or five of them. Off they go. <clears throat> and they were like 50 miles out into Virginia, some little place, had, had lunch, and rode back. But they rode back in a sleet storm. And it took them a lot, more, lot longer. So we finally arrived at the White House. Uh, 
his wife met him at the door, and of course he's crusted with ice and snow, and, and he says, that bully well shows them that that's how to be fit in the army. <laughs> so, has someone mentioned Harry Truman? Yes, sir. Uh, just another thing about Theodore Roosevelt. He was herding cattle out west with a bunch of uh, cowboys. Mm -hmm. And he said, hasten along quickly there, boys. And they laughed at him. Hasten forward quickly. That's right. That's, he was famous for that. Yep, they laughed out loud because he was the New York bred. Harvard-educated uh, young Eastern Easterner who was out on, on the West in the Dakotas ranching camp. And of course, he did that. Why did he go west? Not only did his wife die, his mother died at the same house on the same day, Valentine's Day. And so, if you ever see pictures of his diaries, a big black X through that thing. And uh, and his mother, by the way, was Mitty. Bullock. Bullock from Georgia. Bullock from Roswell, Georgia. And there you have it. So everything comes full circle, it seems. Um, Harry Truman, when I was, when I was, when he was uh, famously, when he was setting up his own presidential museum uh, in Independence, Missouri, um, who would come to give the opening speech but Winston Churchill? And Winston Churchill used that opportunity to give his famous Iron Curtain speech at Harry Truman's opening of his museum. Uh, he coined the phrase, Iron Curtain. Uh, and if you ever get a chance to see the movie The Darkest Hour, about a couple years ago, really a great uh, Winston Churchill. Mm -hmm. Now, we know a lot about these men because of their letters and their diaries and what they wrote. Theodore Roosevelt famously wrote thousands and thousands of letters. Uh, but there's one president we know very little about in part because there's no historical documentation. This was Chester A. Arthur. Chester Arthur became president when James Garfield was assassinated. And the whole country held their breath because Chet Arthur, oh my god. He was a known, um, he was the, 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 the head of the Port of New York tax collector. He was kind of famous for being maybe yeah, a little crooked, a little bit under the table. And so uh, he's president. And everybody held their breath. Well, he did pretty good, actually. He was a bit of a reformer. He did some things that were good. He did not run for a full term in the zone because he knew he was dying. He was dying from Bright's disease, which is today better known as kidney disease. What he did toward the very end was he got his valet and his butler and said, I want you to burn all my papers. And that's exactly what they did. They burned everything that he had. So there's no historical record about much about Chester A. Arthur that we could know. Um, so I mentioned presidential library. Who do you think has the first presidential library? Anybody want to hash the guess? Nope, not true. Long before. It was Rutherford B. Hayden, one of our more obscure presidents. We grew up 40 miles from Fremont, Ohio, which is where he was from. That's where his presidential library is. And it was started in conjunction with the family approaching the state of Ohio saying, can we make a tourist destination out of this somehow? And they said, sure. So they put together some money, got the hold of the property, and there's a very nice museum about Mr. Hayes right there in uh, Fremont, Ohio, if you ever get close. Um, <coughs> JFK strikes most of us as a heroic, tragic thing. How many of you would remember where you were when you heard the news? So where were you then? I was at work. Heard it on the radio. Heard it on the radio. You were at work. How about you? I was at school. You were at school. So was I. I was at school. Someone else? Yes? I was at Myrtle Beach Air Force Base. Okay. I was at the airport. I see. And you heard it through, like, Television or? Okay, okay. Well, it was, uh, it was quite, a, quite a scene, um, of course. And turns out my brother, my brother, William Malcolm, Sergeant William Malcolm, he was stationed at Fort Myers, which is on the Arlington, uh, right there next to Arlington. And he was, he was uh, 
sergeant of the guard for the, at the tomb of the unknown. So he was doing that as his duty. And when the president was assassinated, he was selected to call the 21 gun salute at Mr. Kennedy's tomb. And so if you ever look at the book, The Death of a President by William Manchester, he was the, the family, Kennedy family's selected biographer for, for Mr. Kennedy. Um, my brother-in-law was interviewed and quoted at the end and, and a few things there about what he did uh, in support of Mr. Kennedy's deed. Um, and there was another interesting story about that event. It was so powerful. You might remember everyone was glued to their television for three or four days. It was just that intense. Everyone was in tears. Everyone was crying. It was, it was a national tragedy unfolding minute by minute. So here they are. They're at Arlington. The speeches have been given. The eulogy is given. And they're getting to the point where they're going to Jackie Kennedy had already left. And they were getting ready to lower his casket into the ground. And the, the man who was in charge of funerals at the Arlington National Cemetery, they were still, by the way, still broadcasting television. Hello, they got lights up, they got all this stuff. He went over to them and said, you know, out of respect, I really think you should stop broadcasting. Let's turn these lights off, let's, let's do this right. And they said, nope, not stopping. This is the biggest thing since in television, we're going to keep going. He said, okay. He turned and went, found a telephone. He called the engineer at Arlington National Cemetery and said, turn off the power. <laughs> and the cameras went silent, the lights went out, and Mr. Kennedy was lowered in the ground in peace. Someone mentioned Dwight Eisenhower. Um, of course, Dwight Eisenhower, tomorrow, he, he, that was Maybe his biggest uh, contribution, he wrote two letters in preparation for, for D-Day. The invasion was either going to work or it wasn't. He had a letter for each. And then the one that he never had to use, which said, in this case, we failed, our, our invasion had failed, he took completed 100% responsibility. Never had to use it, thank you. The cool story I heard a little bit ago because when I met Seth Hopkins, who runs the executive director here, he was speaking of Big Canoe, right? And um, introduced myself when we got talking. Well, that group called the Knowledge Series at Big Canoe, their last speaker a few months ago, it was a woman who was a historian at Kennesaw State. She's written a book about Eisenhower and golf. It's about published about 12 years ago. But she's told one really cool story. He was a big golfer. You might recall, he loved to golf. He was a member at Augusta. He golfed all the time. He had a putting green out the Rose Garden Lawn. During World War II, he didn't have too many chances to play golf. But in Italy, in 43, it was somehow arranged where he and General Marshall, General George Marshall, were going to play around the golf. So it was all laid out. A lieutenant in the army was uh, his caddy. And they were, like two days before, spread out the, the course, look at the thing, and this, this hole, that hole. And Mr. Eisenhower said, this is all fine except for that one hole right here. That's going to be a problem because that hole was too easy for General Marshall. I want to put a bunker right there. And the lieutenant said, uh, it's 48 hours from now. I don't know how I'm going to get that done, sir. And he said, I think I know how. Have the Army's most accurate bomber pilot coming to the <laughs> And that's exactly what happened, apparently. The plane came right down the fairway and dropped it right in front of the green. Boom! Got your bunker, filled it with sand, and there you have it. <laughs> and now you know the rest of the story. So which president do you think coined the term war hawk? War hawk. All I care about hawks and doves and all that, birds. War hawk. Where, 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 where did that come from? Yeah. That was Mr. Jefferson. Something that's lost in the annals of the State Department is something called the XYZ affair. And it was a dispute, this diplomatic dispute with France. And not unlike today, when we get all puffed up and all irritated about something we want to go, we want to go to war, let's go fight for what we think is right. 
Well, they were became known as Warhawks. And Mr. Jefferson coined that term, said, you are a Warhawk. So last one I want to mention, and we're going to take some questions, um, is how many have heard the phrase, politics makes strange bedfellows? Yes. Well, interestingly, that was a quote from Mrs. Wendell Wilkie. Mrs. Wilkie was the wife of Wendell Wilkie, who was running against Franklin Roosevelt when he was trying to get his third term as president. It's the 1940 election. The only problem was the, the times were different. Running as president as a divorced man would be totally unacceptable and had never happened. He was estranged from his wife. He was having an affair with another woman altogether. But he asked his wife, would you campaign with me? And she said, I will. And politics makes strange things. <laughs> so here's one for you. Jim's introduction mentioned that I had been a docent at the Taft Museum in Cincinnati. Mr. Taft is famous for a number of things, but one thing that he, in his career, that will, I will say, will never, ever be repeated in our history. Can you tell me what that is? That's exactly right. The only man who's been both the head of the judiciary and the head of the executive branch. It probably never happened again. Of course, it was President first. He was from Ohio. He's hated being president. He's happy to lose to Woodrow Wilson. Goes to back east. He's you know, teaching law, I think, at Columbia. And his good friend, Warren Harding, becomes president in 1920. There's a vacancy on the court, and guess who gets to be Supreme Court Chief? William Hunt. And the building you see in Washington, the one that's the Supreme Court, that beautiful building, he had that created. He, he made the case to the Congress, because the, the uh, Supreme Court's offices were always in the bottom basement of the Capitol. That's where they were. He wanted it. They needed more space. They were growing, growing. He says, I'd like to get this building done, and they got it. Built. He was. He died like three or four months before it opened. Um, so, yeah, we're looking at time. So, the last thing I would do, I want to show you a couple of newspapers. We mentioned, of course, about Mr. Kennedy. So, this is the Dallas Morning News. The day after Mr. Kennedy was. I apologize. I want to get these put in the slides so we can put it in better form. Um, and, and later, we had this is from the Honolulu Star. This is about the Pearl Harbor war bombing in Pearl Harbor. And of course, that kicked us immediately into World War II. We all know that Mr. Roosevelt got his fourth term, but he didn't make it through the fourth term. He only made it a, a few weeks into his fourth term. This is the Toledo Blade, which is our hometown. And uh, when Harry Truman found out he was going to be president, he'd been vice president for like know, 90 days. He'd seen Roosevelt once in 90 days. And when he said, what was your reaction upon hearing the news, Mr. President? He said, I felt the moon, the stars, and the earth had all fallen on my shoulders. Treat this one carefully. This is the Cleveland Herald from the day that James Garfield died. So this is 1881. This is like 137 years old. Um, he died tragically. He was assassinated. He was shot in the back at the Union Station in DC. By a disappointed office seeker. And unfortunately, he lingered in, in the doctor's then in medical practices. He didn't know how to get the bullet out. And so they probed and stuck their fingers in the wound and did all. He died of sepsis. Mm -hmm. A very nasty way to go. Mm -hmm. um, and the last one I will show you. Um, so this was another one from this is the actual the Dallas Morning News, another one of the papers uh, from Kennedy's assassination. And of course, that's when Lyndon Johnson became a, a president. And, uh, and famously got us into the Great Society. 
So at this point, I want to um, just open this up to some questions and see what else you might uh, want to ask me. Yes, sir. I've got a question, but a couple weeks ago, my wife and I had a guest to visit the little White House. And for anybody who hasn't been here, I really recommend that you put it on your bucket list. This is FDR's place of warm springs. Yeah. Yes, totally recommend that. Uh, it's only an hour and a half drive from here. That's where he died. It is where he died. They do. It's all adapted so he can he could drive it even though he was paralyzed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a great museum. Uh, the little White House. It's such a nice small little cabin. But it's definitely worth it. Yep. As is, by the way, planes. If you haven't been to planes, go to planes and see this charter stuff. It's worth a visit. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Yes, Lucy, Lucy Mercer was there. The short story is he fell in love with Lucy Mercer very many decades before. And Lucy Mercer was Eleanor Roosevelt's sec private secretary. And FDR, they fell in love. And eventually, in 1980, Eleanor found out about it. She said, I'll stay married to you, but you got to make sure that she's out of your life. And so he said, okay. If he hadn't died, she would have killed him. <laughs> yeah, well, over here. she never really left his life. It all kind of happened behind the scenes. And you can imagine being Eleanor finding out that Lucy was there when Franklin died. Yeah, yeah that would that'd be pretty rough. Yes, ma'am. Grant, uh, President Grant, Grant was an artist. Yeah, uh, yeah. Who else was an artist when we did the thing? Well, yeah. Bush is an artist. Grant's an artist. And uh, and Carter and Eisenhower. Carter and Eisenhower. Carter and Eisenhower. Carter, okay, yeah. You mentioned you mentioned about where people were when when Kennedy was killed. I was in college, in University of Colorado, and had gone home. Uh, and had been told my dad was, was dying of cancer. And I was in the hospital uh, visiting with my dad, and they came in and told us that President uh, Kennedy had been assassinated, and I felt the world was falling apart at the time. My wife, who's 10 years younger, was in school, which was a Catholic school, and the, the nun came in and wrote on the blackboard, President Kennedy has been killed. And, and Suzanne raised her hand and said, no, sister, no, that was President Lincoln. <laughs> and then none broke into tears. Yes. Oh, wow. you know, so yeah. My favorite letter, you know, we have a letter from every president of the United States on display in the in the in the presidential gallery. My favorite letter is by Millard Fillmore. How many people love Millard Fillmore as their favorite president? <laughs> so far I'm betting a thousand. No one's ever said. But Millard Fillmore's letter was written to his financial advisor. Because he wanted to know, you know, what his the, the money that he was investing, whether he was going to be able to retire. And a portion of the letter says, "I am surprised at the velocity with which it appears that my stock has descended in the market, <laughs> but it cannot be helped, and I want to take your advice and hold on to the remaining 40 shares. How does my account stand now? Had I not better sell some of my bonds and invest the proceeds in more safe securities? I fear a blow up in the money market." That letter could have been written this afternoon. <laughs> it's amazing. Right? Yeah. So you get a chance to go read some of those letters. Yeah. Um, I do enjoy the pennies that we have here. I know that they have a number in ratings. Uh, like mm -hmm. I have uh, my, my boss in my work, he knows of my presidential hobby. And he was at a local uh, art show, and there were some. Penley's of Rose, Theodore Roosevelt, Abraham Lincoln, and Thomas Jefferson. And I walked into my work uh, day a few later, and he had bought them for me. So I now have three Penley's in my little presidential office. Uh -huh. Yeah, great out of love. Yes, sir. Yeah. 
fascinating part was, for me, it was always, um, he was the one who, in his famous speech, says, here's my goal. I think we should get to the moon by the end of the decade and bring the man back safely. And, and that was the rallying moment and marshaled all resources to make it happen. Of course, we were one of the first, not let the Russians get there first. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I've always wondered, why can't that type of rallying cry be established for some national goal? Really, we could get consensus around and just go to I'm still waiting for that. Other questions? Well, I appreciate your time and your energy. Uh, my name and contact information is up there for a reason, and that is because I love to do this talk. I've given it lots of times. I give it to social uh, service groups and church groups. It's free, and if you reach out to me, and I can do it, it's all reasonable, I'd be glad to come do it for one of your groups, too. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. So, gentlemen, Chris Brinkers, thank you.